Hello, all you skibbies. This is Great Dancer, and this is another episode of the Ropecast, and I am especially pleased to bring you this particular episode. Uh, I don't normally go for the whole, hey, tell a friend, send it to somebody else, but I am almost positive that every one of you who's listening to this knows someone who would benefit from what is involved in this interview. This, cl- this uh, I would say this class, hopefully someday it'll be a class. We need more classes like this. Um, my friend uh, Lisa, uh, Tame Lioness, so you may know her as, uh, is a person who she and her partner have been dealing with cancer for many years. And they've also managed to keep their rope practice alive. And this entire episode is... Uh, talking with her about that. Well, I guess part of it talks about something else, but I got so much out of hearing what she had to say. Uh, it, it was inspiring and I hope it will inspire you. It's also really long, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it beforehand, but I will just say that this is a thing where when you listen to this or if you know someone who is dealing with some kind of a Um, any kind of physical or mental impediment to their rope practice and they're trying to find ways to adapt to it and they can't quite keep up with some of the rope rock stars that you see on Instagram and things like that, send them this episode. Um, They they will get something out of it. I I almost guarantee it. Um, So I will also thank, as usual, my sponsors. Uh, I'd like to thank my friend Monk, from twistedmonk.com, you can get his latest stuff from rope.twistedmonk. Sorry, rope.greatanswer.com. Yes, if you go that way, I get to have a little bit of a gift certificate, which I can then later on give away. Uh, when I get a gift certificate, I offer it out to those of you who are out there in the audience, so you can help contribute to possibly getting a free uh, gift certificate to Twisted Monk Rope. And also, I want to thank Leah Lure who is a good friend of mine and also a sponsor of this podcast. LeeAllure.com is her website. She does erotic hypnosis and various kinds of things. She also organizes events um, both around hypnosis and around tickling. Um, and, you know, she's a friend of the, of the rope community. She's not that uh, involved in herself, although she can do some pretty fun hypnosis tricks uh, involving rope and bondage. So check out leolure.com or hey, just send either her or Twisted Monk a uh, little note saying thanks for sponsoring the Ropecast because it is definitely a good help. They help me pay for my hosting and uh, occasional upgrades to the equipment and software and stuff like that. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to get right into the interview. We used it recording Skype. Um, There was some... It, it was not the most clean recording ever. I have put in some time cleaning it up as best I can, so I apologize for the audio quality in advance, but uh, it is definitely understandable. And like I said, this is probably one of the best and most meaningful interviews I've ever done on this cast in you know 12 years of doing it. So thank you, Lisa, for taking part in it, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Through the magic of Skype and a wonderful cross-border friendship between the U.S. and Canada for as long as it lasts, I am <laughs> really, really glad to welcome my friend. I, I was about to call you by your first name, and I don't know if you want to have you out of that. Lisa's so, fine, yeah. Uh, Lisa's fine. Um, I, you may know her uh, online or after, through the uh, Kate community as uh, Tame Lioness, right? Tame Lioness on Twitter and Lisa12366 on Fat. Right. Um, and um, now I, I, it's kind of funny. Uh, I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time, oh, you know, um, and um, I, I don't think I realized, I don't think either of us realized that we were kind of coming into each other's lives in a, in the middle of certain other epic things like tangents. I feel like there's these big arcs where we tangentially touch and then we go off on our own little adventures and then we come back in and then we touch again and like that kind of thing. Um, but one thing that we've always shared is uh, we've always shared a lot of passion for the rope community and for doing things. And um, you are located in Vancouver, correct? Yes, I am. The, the, the Canadian Vancouver. Canadian Vancouver, yeah. Right. Um, 
And uh, I guess I want to start out so that we can make sure we get the important part taken care of. Um, not that you're, not the other part isn't important, but that the the more urgent part taken care of. Um, uh, Metro Vancouver Kink, uh, which is an organization that I've had the privilege of interacting with a lot of times, but um, love the things that you guys do, um, have uh, kind of in a bind right now and are raising some funds to try and get out of it. Do you want to talk about what's going on right now? Yeah, I will. We um, Some stuff came to our attention a couple of years ago, and it went from rumors of things and underground gossip to people actually coming forward to MVK to tell their stories about someone in the community who runs a venue out of his house, who, you know, I had known for years and had been friendly with and then realized that there was some not good stuff going on. I had talked to him. Tom had talked to him. Others had talked to him. He wasn't changing. And I guess it was the end of 2016 stuff came out. MVK tried to talk with him, tried to do, we did a couple of town halls. Now, I will say I am not on the board of MVK. I have a leadership role with the conference, West Coast Bound, yay, but I'm not on the board mm-hmm. of MVK. So the board began putting up town halls, having um, counselors come in to talk to people, trying to resolve it with this individual, which did not work. And so at the end of it, MVK at the town hall published an open letter, effectively saying these are the things that have been brought to us in in gross terms. Uh, These are the kinds of things we've been hearing, and we will disassociate ourselves with you. We will not rent your venue. We will not recommend you. You may not come to our events. Fast forward, he filed a lawsuit in Supreme Court against MVK and against each board member individually for defamation. He then went on to file two more lawsuits, naming four other people, including one victim who had written out her story, including a woman who had taken notes at a meeting he held at his home. So that's been that's been extremely difficult. You know, with civil lawsuits, you can sue someone if you don't like how they made your sandwich. You can sue for anything. BC just passed legislation. Uh, to to combat slap lawsuits. So slap lawsuits are designed to shut down speech and public interest. It's usually a a company or an individual with more money than the people they're suing who throws lawsuits in the path. BC put legislation in place that said the person being sued or the group being sued could step forward and put in an application to have the suit thrown out because it's, it's a slap suit. So MVK has taken on a law firm. Uh, We were being represented really ably and well pro bono, but when we couldn't settle, we had to get a law firm and they've they've put in an anti-slap application. That's going to be heard later this month. If that goes well, if the courts agree, if it's adjudicated out and it's thrown out, it's still going to cost us $50,000. Right. If they don't throw it out, it goes to court, and that's probably more like $100,000. So MVK, to its credit, has been extremely well managed, and they've been able to put the retainer down. They've been able to hire a law firm that, that's really fantastic. Um, depositions were last week, but, you know, it's two days of eight-hour days at $500 an hour for the lawyer, um, plus the prep work. So we have a GoFundMe set up, and you know, you've got the link. I hope you put that up. Oh, yeah, that'll be in the show notes as well as in the uh, Twitter. If you search MVK on GoFundMe, you will find it. Um, We've raised a little under 16,000 Canadian now. And of course, for you guys in the US, it's not even real money, right? Just throw money at it because it's free. Stretch stretch your dollar more, yes. It doesn't hurt a bit. Uh, We're also having an auction coming up. And I'm asking people who, if you run an event, can you throw us a couple of tickets? Hey, Greg, can you throw us a couple of tickets? Uh, if you um, if, if you teach, can you throw us some Skype lessons? If you make stuff, can you throw us some stuff? We're going to be running the auction August 2nd to 11th, and we've got things like two tickets to Tether Together, 
We've got private lessons with Full Circle Kink, private lessons with Xanthine. Uh, we've got some books by Princess Callie. We've got some books by Evie Vane. We've got stuff coming in that I think is going to be really fun. And we're going to be creating pins that say, I defend MB, or, I support MBK, that you'll be able to get for a donation. But I think this is important. It's not just important to us. We've had other cases of individuals trying to sue victims in the community. The one out of Baltimore is the best known. Right. Suing victims and suing organizations that stand up for the community is really not cool. Uh, the person with the most money should not be able to win. And so we're, we're hoping that the community stands with MVK because if we can win this, if we can knock this down, it makes a pretty strong statement to suspect individuals everywhere that suing your victims or threatening to sue your victims is really not a viable answer. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of where I come down on this. I, I've had people, you know, say, well, you know, I've looked at the examples of, uh, you know, I don't know if they did what they did and things like that. Not, not necessarily in this case, but oh, yeah. in other cases. And my response is always, we know for a fact that rather than try and, you know, rather than try and, and resolve this, um, they are resorting to, you know, um, suing as a, as a punitive measure, like you say, as, as a, a way to try and just, you know, beat this person into, into you know, giving up um, or as a punishment. And I'm like, I, that, that's stifling. I mean, on one level, you can hear stifling free speech on another level. It's just a dick move. I mean, it, yeah. it's just really... It, it does not speak well, and it, and it's chilling because it it makes more people uh, less willing to to speak up, which to me means that you know the person rather than you know working through things in whatever way is necessary on a personal level is willing to sacrifice the community for their own convenience. Right, and and that um, that to me is just you know regardless of whether they are you know if if they are being wrongly accused or something like that then let's work through that this is not going to do it um i i feel very strongly that any any kind of lawsuit like this um should not you know should be strongly rebuked by the community in general um and and if there are people who want to argue with me about that feel free to let me know i don't care i will i will argue the fuck out of that um Right, so we will have links to the fundraiser, um, which as you said is August second through the. The GoFundMe is active now, and the auction will right. be starting August second. But you'll be able right. to look at it as I add things in. Yes, okay, and so we will have the. If somebody wants to throw me stuff, uh, you can find me on FET. You can find me on Twitter, um, Lisa one two three six six at mac dot com. You can find me there. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, I, I also want to you know, give you some kudos. You also are one of the two uh, main moderators and founders of the Kink Producers Networking Group. That's true. Uh, KPNG, which, um, I mean, <laughs> I, I've heard some people, and I myself have expressed some, you know, that I know, well, I wish it would, I, you know, I, did, I wish it would do this, or I wish it would do this. But at the same time, I completely recognize that it's impossible to have a group that will absolutely please everyone and i think that that group is the closest possibly that we will ever get to having good communication within the the kink community um especially in regards to references and it's definitely improved the the ability to vet presenters and and uh, also keep in keep a, abreast of situations like what you just described um there's a, 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 a collective memory that is being established there. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it's, I want to thank you for, for doing that. I know it's not always easy. I know it's, I, I very much know it's not easy um, to try and, and uh, do those things. And I can tell you that uh, I have found it an invaluable resource um, for, uh, for my own event production and things like that. So. Thank you. Yeah, Shea Blondie and I decided that would a thing like that would be good to have, and I uh, we talked about it and modeled it on some things that I do in my work life, 
and thought we'd run it up and see if anybody saluted. And it's turned out, you know, what, what I like about it is like like the Rope Bottom Share Group too, which Evie Bain runs and I help moderate. It is overwhelmingly positive. Yes, we have a collective memory. Yes, we vet people. But the bulk of that vetting is, yeah, they're great. Uh, so it's not like a giant bitch fest. It's not like a blacklist. It's a really positive place for event producers to come together and talk about, like, what kind of software do you use? Who's processing your tickets? What do you think about mm-hmm. um, As well as what do you do? And, and I've gotten some comments from presenters because this is it's not a presenter group although some people are also presenters of, well, how do we vet producers? Because nobody, be <laughs> nobody wants to be the guy who, who, who teaches for the people who either don't pay or, you know, put you up at the roach coach or um, have a history of rape and violations. So right. I, I think presenters might want to come together and have a group of their own for vetting us. They totally should. And it should not I be me. <laughs> For for the same reason I can't take a leadership position in the KPNG group, I could not do that in a presenter's group. Right. Yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm done. I, I got the groups I'm uh, already done. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, we could sit here and talk for hours about the different ideas of that kind of uh, organizational stuff because both of us are so heavily involved in it. Um, and I think, frankly, not only is there not enough coffee in the world, but I don't think you and I, or I have enough whiskey in the house to uh, be able to handle that. Um, so I'm going to uh, shift the direction of the conversation to what I actually wanted to talk to you about with this. Let's go um, to easier, cancer. Yeah, exactly. Let's, let's, let's lighten the mood. Um, yeah, uh, so you, uh, how, do, how do I refer to your partner? What's the best uh, way? To, what? You can call him Tom or my partner Tom. or my husband. Okay, right. I just want to make sure... So, um, yeah, so you and Tom, um, I met you in New York City um, uh, at a, at a, a, uh, con- at a, a tutorial. We met us at the Vancouver Grew way before that. Oh, we did? Yeah, we oh, did. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We've known each other longer than you remember. My goodness. Yeah, I fade into the background. Nobody notices me, darling. Yeah. <laughs> hey, in my defense. I meet a lot of people. And, okay. and, and, you know. But yeah, no, I, I met I met you at the Vancouver Group. Um, gotcha. We we actually talked for the first time in New York in two thousand right or two thousand fifteen. The Vancouver Group was that the, the one where the guy did the how to stuff a foreskin class? I think so. Yeah, yeah, all the different things to do with the foreskin. Sorry, that that uh, stuck in my head. Um, so. Uh, but your your history uh, goes back much further than that, um, and I think <laughs> I, I take some um, Schadenfreude uh, and 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 satisfaction um, in in sort of being in the rope community so long, uh, in seeing people uh, sort of have to learn the hard way that you don't always stay the you know flexible <laughs> young. Can stay up all night and do seventeen scenes, yes, um, kind of person. Um, and for a lot of people, when they can't do that anymore, they stop doing rope. And there's nothing wrong with that. They go on to hopefully other fulfilling things. But some people manage to find a um, continue to find satisfaction even with the changes in their health and stuff. And you strike me as someone who has done that. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what you've been dealing with and going through as different things have changed in you and your partner's lives and how it is that you are still actively and happily in the community. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass and say, you know, where do you able to go on for 45 minutes about the wonders of your partner's talk? Um, (laughs) uh, You know, so um, what you've been together 28 years. We've been together 28 years. We met at work a little over 28 years ago. And we married coming up on August 10th. It'll be our 25th anniversary. Congratulations. So it's, it's, been, it's been a minute. And Tom, 
Tom started tying people up in the clubs in New York in 71. He was an alpine climber. He was a guy who had a lot of rope. He did not rescue. He knew a lot of rock, uh, a lot of knots. And he started being asked, hey, could you tie my partner up so I can talk him? So he did. He was going into the clubs and tying people up and untying them. And he thought that was fun. Uh, I came to it from a slightly different background, which was I was kind of a, a dyke feminist of the women against pornography persuasion. So I thought, oh, yeah. No, I, when I met Tom, I thought he wanted me to shave my snatch. I thought it was the most ridiculous, perverse thing I had ever heard. So the man did the job well. He completely perverted me. But, you know, we, we started doing little things. And so by 1991, I joined Lesbian Sex Mafia in New York. And I went through their uh, training and orientation. And Tom and I were doing kind of little bonds and stuff. I have systemic lupus. So for a lot of years, my joints were very, very bad. And I was super limited in what I could and could not do. So bondage for me was being tied to the bed. It was not being spun around in inversion. Um, and I didn't really like rope that much because we weren't really doing what we could do. Uh, but we always kept our kink on. We always kept doing stuff. We moved around the world. We worked around the world. Uh, we started doing more serious rope after we got to Vancouver. And my joints were in remission. I was feeling pretty good and I was doing a lot of, of yoga and all of a sudden I could do the crazy stuff and I could do the suspensions and I could do the transitions and I could do the inversions and, and all of that was accessible to me. So we did a bunch of that. And 2013, we had tickets to all the things. We were going to all the conferences. We uh, had tickets to Eurex. We were... You know, we, we agreed we did not want to teach people rope because it's our hobby and, and mm -hmm. we teach other stuff. But Tom was doing rope tasters for MBK. Uh, we, you know, I, I, I was the person requesting Airbnb put in a beans option that I could select because I just kept looking for places that had good beans so we could go out with all the photographs. And, and we were having a blast. In December 2013, I was away for work and Tom was doing rope, uh, a rope placement event and he, he pulled his shoulder. And everything started to slide down. We began to cancel things. He kept pulling more muscles. Things were not going well. And they got worse rather than better. And so we went to King Fest. He was feeling a little better. We went to King Fest. He did one day of the conference and never left the hotel room the rest of the weekend. And two weeks later, he was in emergency. He was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Uh, and he came out five days later. To start to so multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I was going to ask you, don't tell us what that is. What is multiple myeloma? It's, it's a blood cancer, uh, like leukemia, but it acts differently. And one of the things it does is... It eats your bones. So the body has things called osteoblasts to build up new bones, and osteoclasts to eat old bones. Multiple myeloma shuts off the stuff that builds bone and turbocharges the stuff that eats bone. So when he went into hospital, he had five fractured vertebrae, 12 open ribs, both clavicles were broken, and a size hole through his right iliac, which then fractured. Um, he lost three inches in height. And what he'd done in December was not cool muscle, he had broken a clap. Wow. Tom is no fun to cough because he's got the pain tolerance in the line up. So you know, he, he was walking around with practically perfect. And that clearly changed our rope. Like we had not done rope in a while since December because he did Now he was in trouble. Uh, he couldn't walk. He was broken. Uh, when the pelvic was fractured, he, he, it, it broke. And so we wound up having to adapt a lot of things. You know, among them, neither of us do DF. That's not part of what we do. And, and, and Tom actually has kind of an aversion to DS. So not being able to walk and do things on his own was really upsetting to him. And we needed to create some kind of service dynamics. So what we did was we created a minion evil genius service dynamic. 
snap his fingers and I would go, <laughs> and I would bounce around and get what he needed because then we could laugh about it. We could have fun about it. We could make it something that was, it was a necessity and it wasn't a happy necessity, but we could turn it into something that was fun for us. And, and I think that really encapsulates how we have kept our lives and our sex and our kink and, and everything going through 28 years is we don't just make lemonade out of it. We make lemoncello. We absolutely turn whatever we've got into the best we can be. So I, I have to think that you, well, I guess I won't assume. Did you already, before this happened, have like just rock star level communication? Um, with each other, or did you have to learn new methods of talking about this stuff? Because there's there's so much. I mean, riggers will sometimes feel like you know they can't admit that they are tired, much less you know that they have a a a, you know, a debilitating disease that is literally eating their bones. Um, and a lot of people, um, you know, would would withdraw in or with. You know, how, how did you communicate that? Or was it already in place or did you have to learn new skills? We, we always had good communication skills, but nothing we had prepared us for this. Like everything. So how did you get through it? Um, we, we focused down. I, I was very fortunate. We were been retired for a while. I'm 72 now. I'm 57. Uh, but we had been retired for 10 years when this happened. And so I didn't have to leave and go to a job. I didn't have to get on top of the We were able to, to, to really go narrow. And we had, we, he was on high dose steroids, which everything you've heard about road rage is true. Um, so, you know, at one point, he started screaming at me that the jam was not what he thought the jam should be. And I absolutely started sobbing. I'm like, well, no, it's not him, it's the steroids, but it doesn't matter because we have to work through this. Uh, we have to figure out how to communicate properly. So we became extremely gentle with each other. And we would simply sit and talk. And, and, and he's, not, he's not a verbal person in a lot of ways. He's a physical touch person. And he could not hold me. He could not roll over in bed and hug me. He couldn't stand and hug me. So several times a day, I would just go over and sit with my head in his lap. And he would put his hands on my head. Because that was what we could do. That was really the limit of what we could do physically. And, and so we kept that connection that was important to him. And in that position, we could talk. We could say the things that we needed to say. I could talk about what I was afraid of. I could talk about what what was not working. Um, he could talk about what he needed. The other thing that we did, because I, we found that for us, very often we're both very forceful people. We're both very dynamic people. We're both very stubborn people. And so we can do this. Mm -hmm. And what we, we have for years had what I call a teasing sticker. Tom teases. I generally like it until I don't. So I can pay for it out and do so. And, and because he teased, if he needs to say something serious, he has a serious difference. And if he says it, I will stop and I will listen and pay attention. And we use those a lot. We use those all the time. And, and, and we would, rather than do what we usually do, which is have conversations in the middle of doing other things, we would, you know, it was easy for him to stop. He was in a chair. But, but I would stop. And I would sit and I'd say, okay, I'm going to go pee because I'm on the frequent peer permit. I, I don't go pee first. I can have a long conversation with you. So I'm going to go pee and I'm going to come back. And, and then I am going to pay attention and I'm going to, I'm going to shut my mouth and I'll listen to you. So that he could have that space to talk. Because what he was talking about was he, he didn't want to be fragile. He didn't want to need things. He didn't want any of that. And so I had to shut the fuck up 
and leave him space to do that. And I can be pretty, you know, this will come as a great shock to anyone who knows me, I can be pretty directive. Uh, so This is my shock face, yeah. yeah no. So I had to be like, okay, that wasn't my intention, but it doesn't matter, that was my effect, let's back it out. And, 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 and what, what, you know, I thought I was asking, you heard it as a, as a demand, how could I phrase that better? so that you hear it in the way I intend it. And I mean, literally, we, at this point, like, we've been married for 20 years, and, and we had to restructure our communication so that we could move through it. What's come out of that, and I mean, we're still in it. My, my mom is not a curable cancer. Tom is back in chemo. He's doing really well, but he's back in chemo. Um, that has helped us in everything. It's helped us in our rope. It's helped us in our sex. It's helped us in our thing. Because cancer or no cancer, we do not have the bodies we had when I was a competitive martial artist in the real climate. Those bodies are gone. Um, we've got bodies that work really well and that we like and that do cool stuff, but they are not the bodies we had before. So, and, and we're not the people we were before. So those skills that we learned through getting through the worst year of our lives still help. We still use them. Uh, yeah, I, I find it very interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know if you've had um, how much contact you've had with other people in the that also are going through this kind of thing. But it, it sounds like uh, the the kink actually gave you some extra tools that help you get through this kind of a life experience. Oh, it absolutely did. Uh, one of the things that, that changed, I'm, you know, for, for, for all that I'm really keen on consent, and, and you know that, I'm a groper. So if I have permission to go through, I'm a groper. And for, for 20 years, I could kind of go and get an after grab. I could go in the course of things. I no longer do that. You know, he has less bodily autonomy now because the medical system has a lot of things to say about what he does with his body and when. Um, his relationship to his body and his point. I ask permission to touch him. I mean, not to hug him, but, but even so, you know, he may not be feeling great. So I use consent practices just in normal interactions. Um, we've, we've changed, you know, how we, what we do, and I, I'm pretty proud of my food. Uh, you have a stage here yet, so you can have my food. But my food is awesome. And sometimes we can eat it, and I'll put a bunch of work in, and it goes down the garburetor because it's not what you can eat. I'll make a sandwich. Um, We've had to learn how to make that okay. And a lot of that has come out of communication skills. Uh, I I joke that I'm his medical concierge, but even though I don't have a BS man, I have a really strong German housewife then. So I, I can totally put my energy into that and feel like I am doing things that make his life easier, that make his life better. Um, and he does the same for me. He he holds space for me to fall apart and I need to fall apart. We've never had them have the more happy conversations. Uh, those are not fun conversations to have, especially no. not when it isn't just kind of speculation. Uh, and oh god, he's he's been pretty directive about what I do with that. And where I go and who I call. That's a little DX, right? But you know what? If, if, if the worst happens, I've made some commitments to him. And I've made some promises to him about how I will cope and how I will do things and I will keep them. And those are, those are skills that we have learned or observed or found in the community. Yeah, I have uh, I have been a couple of months out of the last five years. Oh, wow, that's incredibly powerful. Has has the well, you mentioned one particular uh, experience in a class. Um, 
where a rigger uh, said some things that that were not very supportive. <laughs> I know the I'm, I'm sure the rigger didn't intend on it to be come out the way it did, but I confess when I read it, I was I, I wanted to know who it was just so that I could go and slap this person. Um, but do you want to? Talk about your experience. I mean, you both had experience, and also, um, you know, in the in the community, because I have seen you guys out there. I've seen you, you know, at events and, and doing things. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, Tom tied me for the last time in February 2014, and it really hurt. He put a little harness on me because I was three rope starved, and then nothing again until October of 2014. And we had hosted a couple of rope instructors from Japan who spoke almost no English. And then they asked why we went to full tent intensive. And they didn't know what we thought was wrong, but they didn't realize what it was. And so they said, no, no, just come. So we showed up on the Sunday. We were right next to the red. And he demonstrated a harness. And then he came over and asked him why Tom wasn't tying. And, and he said, we didn't bring rope. And he very gently and formally presented Tom with a hank of rope. And Tom, sitting in his chair, wrapped the rope around my chest, and I just lost it. And we didn't know if we would ever be able to do this again. We didn't know if we had lost it. And it's not like he tied a full heart. He did one hank of rope and wrapped it around me, but it was the most amazing thing. And so we began working on how we could do things. Uh, and we've had a couple, of, and that was a great experience. We, we had a great experience with Hana and Kagura last weekend that I'll talk about in a bit. But we had two experiences that were, were bad with instructors. One was unintentional, and he apologized for the person, and he changed how he talks about it. And you know, that was Zamil, who I love like a brother. He stayed with us, we stayed with him, I played with Alex. But in the middle of a workshop, he said, you know, because but Midori uses the phrase healthy as opposed to helpful. And he was telling Bottoms not to, to be healthy, basically, and said, if your rigor can't move you around physically, find another rigor. And and I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, I, I kind of get what you were going for there, but you know, Tom can't move me around physically, right? And he went, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you're right. That was horrible. That is what I meant. But because what we do, and, you know, adaptive skiing, learn to ski with one leg, learn to ski blind, learn to ski with the body you have now. Um, we do adaptive rope. Tom's mm -hmm. always in the chair. And he will sit in the chair, and he will gently direct me so that I turn or I move or I put the leg up so that he can do the bulk of the time with him sitting in the chair. And I put the bottom part where he needs to be based on his direction. I'm not talking from the bottom. I'm not, you know, lifting the leg up going, I'd like to put a now. Uh, I am doing what he tells me to do so that his energy can go to the part he wants to. Um, for his part, I, I tried with him a little bit about this. He said, you know, he has simply gone back to basics. He's gone back to physics. He can suspend me. If he moves me a part of a time, if he shifts the weight, we used to do experiments with spring balances, where you put spring balances on different parts of the suspension and see where the weight really was. So mm -hmm. if he's lifting a leg, if he puts me in a side suspension and I'm standing, and then he lifts a leg, he's only lifting the leg. He is not tying me on the ground and dead lifting me up. Right. He's moving, and, and you know, I, I weigh in at a crushing 130 pounds these days. Uh, he can move parts of that. With relativity, because he's only moving 40 pounds at a time. Uh, well, and rope is a force multiplier, so you know right. it, it does give him more power. So the, the thing that was probably our worst experience in a class was um, Asad Steve. Gotta love him. Mm -hmm. we, we did a one-day workshop. He had us go into a side suspension. And one of the things that we started doing... Um, I don't have shape on me before, I wish, but I have pretty good core. And so Tom put me in the, um, the TK, put me over to the side. And what we generally do anymore is he will tie and lift my lower leg. And then I've got enough core to lift the rest of it. So mm -hmm. he has to bend down and, and raise one leg. And then the rest of me is up in the air because I can suspend off the TK and one leg. Kind of forever. Uh, so 
Hub does this. The direction was going to draw attention. I saw a student come over and start berating Tom in front of the class about how stupid that is. Who raising the bottom light? Because everything is raised the top light because then the snatch is exposed. Um, and Tom is pretty low, so he just lowers the top light and or lowers the the light like the top and and hides the other one. He's like, really, really, you can see the man in a chair. Yeah. But, you know, that was one of those where I let Tom do it instead of me dealing with it. And a, a friend of ours really took him apart afterwards. You know the guy's in a chair, right? I mean, come on. Right, right. Oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But did, did he friend, actually apologize to you or to, to Tom? Oh, no, he apologized to our friends. <laughs> oh, no, heavens. <laughs> no, certainly not. Um, but you know, the, it's normally people are pretty supportive. Barkas keeps a chair and a, and a, and a mat, so you can put a chair on the tatami on top of a mat, to call it, right? I mean, like the, the, the rope community has been amazing, and I think we still look awesome doing our rope. I think it's pretty hot, pretty hot for me. Um, we still are able to do all the stuff. Now, one of the things is we've got our house is, is the wash and suspension, plant, which we don't really use much anymore because the consequence of me being in the air is something happening to the car, whether that's me running out of booze or he breaks a bone. Oh, uh, yeah. Pretty severe. So, if we're going to do a suspension, we tend to do that out where there's people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll do floor work at home. We do things, but, but he's also made it a point to try so that he can very easily get me down. If something happens to him, he can have me on the floor safely, nearly instantly, even if he's broken something. Uh, fortunately, that has not happened. But he wants me to be in a place where I can safely rest until we can get help, or I can get myself out. So he's mm-hmm. actually changed, and, and I do not try at all. Um, so I can't tell you how he's changed that. But, but he has made a conscious point of being sure that everything he does can come down really fast. Um, but we, we went to a Friday night workshop with Kara and Kavara two weeks ago. And we had an absolute freaking blast. It was your work and partial. And he had a very comfy orange armchair. And he sat in his comfy orange armchair and he directed me to move where I needed to move. And he came to the floor when he wanted to do all kinds of hurting things to me. And he stood when he wanted to tie off upline. We had, we have as much fun now as we did when we were doing photo shoots with 10 transitions and I was in the air for half an hour. Uh, we probably have more fun now than we did because that was hard. Um, <laughs> and you know how to have more fun now. I mean, we don't have things you actually want to do. And we play it very much by ear. Every day is different. Every day is different for his body. Every day is different from my body. Uh, we're really good about saying what can we and can't we do today, and and what are we going to do and how we do it. Uh, but I like how we are with our rope, and I like that I feel like we can keep doing this pretty much forever. Uh, we, well, yeah, right. Um, oh. so the, the phrase adaptive rope is just really resonating in my head. And, you know, that, that really is what we all need to be practicing if we want to be in this for the long haul. Yeah. You know, because, because you can't change the fact that your bodies are going to change. And the longer no, you really try not. and keep on doing the same thing, aside from the fact that you're going to have the whole hedonic adaptation, it's not going to be as fun anymore. You're also just, you know, you're, you're, the more you do the same thing over and over again, the less appealing it's going to get eventually. Right. And, you so, know, um, go ahead. There was a point where our rope consisted of me conditioning to and bringing it to him to show it to him. Because we, we, you see the kitchen behind me, there's chairs over there, Tom would sit in the chair, I would condition the dude. And it was like we were making ourselves a promise that we would use that again. We didn't know who mm-hmm. we were. We, we nearly died on the twice in 2004. So, but we were like, okay, this is this, this almost totemic, right? We, we are making this physical statement that we intend to do this again. And 
when, when this last year was so far, normally that's in the fall. And he, it took a while to get meds right. So West Coast found in January, he was not feeling well. He spent most of the time in our room. Uh, he came down, we did one class with Marcus, and it was a seven hour class. And so I was sitting on the floor in front of Tom, who was in a, in a chair. And he didn't even feel like he could bring Ruth out. But he used his thumb, and he dragged his thumb across where the rope would go. And that was our rope for that period in time. And you know what? It was fantastic. It was, it was just fine. Uh, learning not to mourn the things you can't do, because that gets in the way of the things you can do, is a skill. Uh, if I spend all my time sad that we're no longer going out to the trees and hanging me off them in the middle of nowhere, because but I could bring that dangerous. Um, I would miss his thumb across the chest. I would miss his hand in my throat. I would miss the things that we're able to do now that give me incredible joy. I, I think there's one of the valuable parts about this, you sharing this, is that um, I think there's a there's a corollary to this in terms of people. One of the issues that we've been coming up with, and one of the, the blockages to uh, having any kind of a restorative justice kind of system within the rope community, is that people get upset when they can't do this when they when they feel like the thing that they used to do is cut off from them. Right, like if, running, I, if I can't, teaching. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I can't be the leader of this group, if I can't be the person running this, if I can't be the the lead photographer, if I can't be the the presenter, then there's nothing for me here, and and then you know that, that as opposed to trying to find other ways to to contribute and to uh, to do things, and I I, I think that um, or to, or to enjoy things. Yeah, uh, and and it's hard. I'm I'm going through it myself, you know, right now, uh, and and trying to figure out ways to shift from the teacher to and the and the director of the event to other things. Um, uh, mainly because I know I can't keep doing this all the time, uh, and um, and I'm finding ways to enjoy myself, but it's that that that, that self image in there and this. What I find so fucking impressive about you and Tom is that I mean you had you had at a minimum three different self images. You had your own his self image as a rigger, your self image as his bottom, and your self image as a as a couple within the kink community, all of which had to survive a, a extreme change and. Um, I, I think so many people, you know, when they have to go through some kind of change like that and their self-image is threatened to sort of implode and, and don't, you know, aren't no. able to handle it. I, I know I've had many difficult times with much more minor changes in my self-image than what you guys have gone through. No, no, and it, I, it, I'm so impressed. To walk away, but, it, and, and part of it, and one of the reasons that I got involved in working on the conference and in, in being more involved in the community was, you know, it was it was all the glorious perverts who came forward for us when Tom was sick. Uh, we had food deliveries, we had complex deliveries, we had Lego toy deliveries, we had people because everybody's up at all kinds of crazy hours, and and the support that we got made me want to do this. So part of it was this had always been a part of our lives together, and we didn't want to lose it. Part of it was we felt like we needed to, to serve the community because the community had so been there for us when we needed it. But yeah, it was it was hard, and you know, I mean, everything I ever let go of has claw marks all over it, right? I, I did not like letting go of the. Um, I mean, I think I looked pretty good for fifty-seven, but I don't look twenty-seven anymore. Um, that that ship has sailed, so. Getting used to well, this is this is the body that I own, and I'm just gonna rock it. And and if somebody doesn't like it, they don't have to fuck it. It's perfectly fine. Um, they can look in the other direction, but I'm gonna have a good time. That's right. 
the skill, and I think part of that comes with age. And I do not recommend incurable cancer as a way to build your communication <laughs> skills and, and your self-worth and, and self-awareness skills, uh, but it's pretty effective. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I think we'll um, take that as a, as a pretty strong recommendation. Yeah. Um, I, wow. There's probably That's, better ways to do that that are a little less disruptive. I, I would think so. I, I also, I, I have to really thank you for um, being so willing to share this, this painful journey, you know, the, the way it, the way it happened. Um, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of people that really need to hear this, um, that they'd be not, not that they need to hear it, you know, for their own good. Um, but because there's a lot of people who are, I needed to hear right, that are, that are dealing with the fact that they're, their bodies are changing in some way, shape, or form, and, or their circumstances are changing or whatever. And um, finding ways to hang on to this kind of kink is, is very powerful. What One of the things that we always did, and for a lot of our working lives, we were apart most of the week. We had big travel jobs, and, and we'd come together on a weekend. Because we, daily life is daily life, and daily grind is daily grind. And we throw mm-hmm an intense job, when you throw in a lot of stress, when you throw in uh, family life, when you throw in illness, it can be really easy to let the sexy slip. And it can be really easy to let the kink slip, whatever your kink is. And so we're not fake night people. Um, it's never been a concept that's worked for us particularly. But we like even just a little vacation away. Even just we're going to go take a, a hotel room, we're going to go, but we found if, if we go to a kink party, we go, and it revs us up, like we can go out and we can do stuff, we might not tie at home, but if we, if we go to MVK or we go to the development center or we go do something or we go to a conference, it gives us that little bit, and so we quite deliberately use events to give us that, that jump start on keeping the sex killer. Um, that's been very helpful. And we sure don't need to be sick to do that. It's just a way to keep his time. I mean, I've, I've been fucking this man for 28 years. It's still awesome. It's 28 years. And I don't know many other couples who are still as active as we are this long. Mm-hmm. But we, we make it we don't make it a priority in the sense that we make it complication, but we make sure it's there. And, um, you know, we, we make sure that with things going on, because it, I, have you seen that thing with a button where you can, you can hit a button and it lights up on your partner's side of the bed if you're in the mood? Mm-hmm. I think this I've is seen the, that, yes. Oh, my God. Um, but, you know, we will give, in the parliamentary sense, we will give notice of the question. So... <laughs> I will, I, I will go up to Tom and I'll say, I would enjoy sexual congress with you at your earliest meeting. And, and I do it that way, right? It, it's not like a demand. It's, it's, it's actually funny. And then I let it go. Because I know that he will start saving spoons, because depending on where his energy is, and mm-hmm. later too, I'm going to get my bones down. But we, 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 we really have had to turn off any sense of accusatory speech. Right. Um, we've turned off sense of, of unmet expectations because if he's not meeting an expectation or I'm not meeting an expectation, we now know in a way that I think only something traumatic can really tell you that there is no ill intent. There is absolutely no ill intent. If, right. if, 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 That's actually quite comforting and quite nice to know in my bones that he wants me to have everything I want, and I want him to have everything he wants, and we've got real proof of that. So in that sense, it makes it a lot easier if things are not going well, if we haven't cried for a while, if you know we haven't had sex for a week. It's, uh, nobody's trying to cause harm. There's nothing going on here except it hasn't happened. So let's throw the question out and at our early experience. I mean, I felt kind of bad yesterday because I offered to pull the massage table out and give Tom a good going over. And I was too tired to up off the boat. 
I was like, yeah, I'm a shitty wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I, how do you? So, I, and then this, this is, this is, I feel kind of funny asking a personal question, but you know, this has all been personal. Um, so, I think I don't know if you've had to deal with this this fear, but this is the thing that you know, I and I have been together now uh, eleven years, ten, eleven years, something like that. Not quite a fear standards, but, you know, we're still there. And I, I think one of the the things that, uh, the fears that we deal with is not ill intent, um, but is uh, the, the possibility that we're going to get bored with the other person, that one of us is going to get bored, you know, like, oh, you know what, I haven't, I haven't felt like tying, uh, tying rope at all because I've been knee deep in rope craft uh, administrative duties and I just really not interested. Um, and uh, I'm worried that she's going to feel like, you know, I'm not interested in, in her anymore when I am, um, or she's going to worry that I'm getting bored somehow. And, and you have to deal with that. Um, is that. Is that a different fear? Or is that related to the same ill intent idea? We did. We, we consider ourselves partners on the stuff. And we're not really poetic. He was. I'm not good at it. I, I can play and, and talk to other people. That's great. But I have one partner. But one of the things that we've always done that just really good at is we get first dibs on bullshit. So I see a lot of people like, like I rode horses for years. Tom does not like horses. But he learned about dressage because that's what I was riding. And he built me a top box. And he knew my, my horse liked him better than me. But, you know, he... So, and, and I know enough about photography, and I learned to do some bird walking. But if there's a new activity that we want to engage in, if there's something we want to do, if there's a movie I want to go to, Tom's the first person who gets good on that. So there are things that, like, he doesn't want to do. I go to I, I go to horror movies with kids sometimes because Tom doesn't want to go to horror movies. Uh, but he's always asked. And I think that because we've, we've kept abreast of each other's hobbies, we've kept abreast of each other's interests. I don't take pictures, but I know about photography enough to know what he's talking about so I can participate in that conversation. And that really helped keep us interested in each other because we so, yeah, I'm not a photographer, so you could do that with another friend, and you could do that on your own. Yeah, really, tell me what you're doing. Show me why it's interesting to you. So we, right. we've really always done that. The show me why it's interesting to you. Because it keeps us engaged with new stuff about each other as we change. Um, and that, I think, has been really helpful. And, you know, even if, you know, if I, you know, the stuff I do with West Coast Brown, which Tom is only tangentially involved in, I tell him about it. And he knows about it, and I ask him to him. And, and, you know, he, he does wildflower photography, and I am aware of plants in that they are green. Um, that's <laughs> what I want to know about them. It's like, oh, yeah, it's another really pretty small thing. But but I, I where I'm, I'm kind of a cynical person in a lot of ways. Um, actually, I'm a very helpful person with kind of a cynical cover story. But... When I don't know something, when I feel inferior, when I feel inadequate, I can hide behind a cynical little There are little flowers right by it. I work really hard not to do that. I work incredibly hard to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know what those are. Can you show me? Being vulnerable. And that lets me stay connected. To him, to other people, to just say, you know, can you show me what's interesting about that? I'm not saying I want to see it. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you love about it so that I can understand it. Um, and I used that a lot because I was I was ready to do if you didn't do something perfectly, you need to stop doing it and don't bother me. <laughs> it's really hard for me. You know, I'd go into a closet and get really good at something and then come out and go, ta uh, But yeah. New things, man, I, I, I ran away. So learning to say, you know what? No, I'm probably not very good at that, or I really don't know what those are. And I'm dyslexic, so there are things I'm never going to get good at, and I'm not interested in other things I'm not going to get good at. Them. But I can at least be curious and humble and open to not knowing things. And you know, bringing it back to the rope, uh, you know what? 
I don't care what I look like doing it. I don't anymore. Uh, Tom and I were at a party the other night, and apparently we had an audience. We were doing some floor work on our, it was floor work on our couch, and, and, you know, I found out the next day that apparently everyone had moved into that room to watch us crying. And I had no idea, because I used to care a lot more, and now I don't care at all. And if someone gets pleasure out of watching, that's great. And if somebody doesn't want to watch old people fucking, they don't have to watch old people fucking. In their- <laughs> walk away. Um, nothing to see here. Yeah. I'm much more focused on my experience and, and what I can share with other people and what they can share with me, mm-hmm. rather than how I am perceived. That you got nothing left to prove. Yeah. yeah. That took serious hard mouth work. There's a therapy behind that. Hmm. We um, we are approaching the one hour mark, which is usually about the limit for for podcast. Um, I would like to do. You know, let's let's just let's let's end on a lighter note. I'm going to throw my lightning questions at you. If that's all right. Um, and with a bonus lightning question that that's going to come at the end too. Um, Simple question. Uh, what is your uh, what's your favorite food? Favorite meal? Um, I will eat Thai food anytime, day or night. Hotter the better. Nice. And your and your beverage of choice? Coffee. I roast my own coffee. Um, uh, I have one of those machines where you push a button and it grinds the beans and steams the coffee. And yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm 32 years sober, so I can spend as much money on coffee as I want because I'm no longer buying scotch. That makes sense. All right. If I uh, if I said, hey, uh, I'm about to go on a, a long trip. I need to bring a book. What book would you recommend that I read? Good Omens. Ah, what if I'd already read that one? Read it again. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Uh, probably Cryptonomicon. Ah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah that, that Cryptonomicon was my reward for graduating college as an adult. I was a returning adult student, and I got the book. I'm like, I don't have time to read this yet, but when I graduate, I will read this book. Um, uh, okay, and uh, what if I said, well, I, hey, I'm just going to be on the airplane. I, I need to watch a movie. Um, what, what movie would you recommend that I watch? Dogma. Dogma? Yeah. Okay. All right. My life is a movie. It makes fun of religion and affirms life, so I like it. Yes. This is true. It's interesting. You have a thing going here now, you know, uh, Good Omens and then Dogma. Uh, all right. Um, what uh, What is something um, unusual that people would be surprised that you have in your toy bag? Oh, that they'd be surprised I have in my toy bag. That leaves out the yeah. photo. Um, <laughs> what would they be surprised I have? I have a very nice set of metal claws that fits my left hand, so my right hand can do pressure point work on my left hand. Ooh, wow, nice. That's that's very specific. Um, so, uh, and I'm and I'm uh, you you well. You already said that you do your your nom. How did you say it? Non monogamous. Non monogamous. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this will be a this will be a, a, a fair question. Um, so I have a magic wand. And if I wave my magic wand, I can make anyone fictional, real, alive, dead, whatever, any, any, per, any person or imagined person in history appear and want to play with you. Who would you like to have manifest? Can I have Helen Mirren, please? Helen? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, honestly, and it's kind of funny because, I mean, it's Helen Mirren at any age. I yes. mean, if you. No kidding. She is amazing. My, my other sort of favorite recommended movie is the the Reds and Re, uh, Red and Red Two. Yes. That woman. Yes. I, I joke with West Coast Brown that I am Sarah's Helen Mirren. I kill people, dear. You know, Sarah points me at something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hundred percent agree. Um, okay, and uh, um, the 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 second the penultimate. Normally, this would be the last one, but the. Um, what is your favorite dirty word? And by dirty word, I mean something that arouses you, not like an, an exclamation, but like what is a what is your f- favorite little filthy turn-on word that makes you blush? Oh wow, that that isn't something I particularly do. 
I'm not a talk dirty person particularly. Um, so I don't actually know that I have one. Hmm. Okay. Do you have a favorite dirty word or something like that or something you just enjoy reading or hearing or something? Um, if I'm, if I'm cursing, normally I curse in English. And if I'm cursing kind of as an exploit, something has happened, I've dropped something on my foot. I'm, I'm genuinely shocked. I curse in German. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, it's, it's sort of like with A, right? There's Boston, there's, there's, there's English, mm-hmm. there's German, and when it goes to German run, um, it's kind of that. But I, I say fuck a lot. Okay. Fuck is a good, a good word. Um, so my, uh, my last question that I don't normally ask, and I think I should add it in here, um, and this is your, your, cause your knowledge of the kink community and presenters and things like that is really up there. Who is a presenter that you would like to see more of, whether personally or someone that you think, you know, should be more, uh, out there or, or the people that you would recommend if people had a chance and preferably somebody that maybe people don't know about. Okay. This is not a rope person per se. But a okay, really that's fine. person who does not present enough and is sort of semi retirement Frozen is uh, Frozen is a terrific teacher. He's got Sorry, a Frozen? Frozen Merceau. Oh, Frozen Merceau, yeah. Okay. Um he, he's a terrific human. And his classes are fun and engaging and you know, I I'm a structure person. I'm a get your basics right person. And then once you get your basics right, you can do absolutely anything. So I'm perfectly mm-hmm. happy to spend a long time getting the basics right. And anybody who does rope at all can learn so much from Frozen's anatomy classes, from his basic classes, from his mm-hmm. come out of that with a much better understanding of how bodies work. Um, the other person I think should be out and out more is Anthony. Uh, Xanthine? Yep. X A N T H I N. X A N T H I N. X A N. Right. Yep. They are an amazing presenter. They do, they, they, they constantly create new classes. They have a lot of broad experience. Um, they're extremely creative. And, and I think they're, they're not getting enough, enough play. Or I think, hmm. I think they're not getting enough. Um, gigs because every class they do is tremendous. Cool. Well, that's good to know, and and thank you for giving me two new people to ask about having in the podcast. I don't think I've had either one of them on the podcast before. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Well, um, if people want to touch base with you, are you open to people giving comments or feedback on this? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And if, and if anybody is going through, whether it's a mental health issue, a physical health issue, it doesn't have to be cancer. I've spent f- over five years doing this shit, and I have built some pretty good skills and coping mechanisms. And can I leave one thing that I didn't get to here that, that has been... Sure, helpful? absolutely. So, after Tom was better, 2015, like we saw us in 2015, and he was doing better. I would have panic attacks. I would have flashback level panic attacks. And, and, and poor Tom would look at me and go, what did I do? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> um, and so I sat with it. And, and what I realized was I got through 2014 by taking out enormous emotional loads. If I had broken down in 2014, Tom would be dead. We made it through because I took out loans emotionally so I could do all the things I had to do. Mm-hmm. When he was better, I had to pull those back. And so all the processing I didn't do in 2014, I did in 2015. I, I was on a payment plan for all of the crap. But what, what that made me realize is every time I had a plan, it was a really good thing. It meant I had enough energy and enough spoons and enough ability to pay that bill. That my brain mm. knew I was getting better and I had the resources to do it. So instead of looking at it as like, an, oh, well, I'm not getting better. Oh, well, I'm still having this. When is this going to go away? I looked at it as a positive. 
of making the payment on this thing. And, and it completely transformed how I dealt with those experiences. And I think it shortened the amount of time it took me to help So I will leave people with that because I think it's probably the most important thing I learned about my own personal through the, the five years. Emotional wounds. I like that idea. That, that, that has a lot of applications. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we, how how can people get a hold of you if they need to contact you? Is it uh, Twitter or FetLife? Or? Twitter or FetLife work best. Email if you have to. But um, I'm going to respond better on Twitter or even that. Great. I will have links to that all in the show notes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gray. It was great talking with you.